Good morning's worship. That's better. That's me on now. Good morning. Welcome to this morning's worship. Welcome to us all here in the church and also welcome to everyone who's joining us on the live stream, whether you're watching live now or recording later on, wherever you are, you're welcome. We come together this morning to worship. But before we start, we have a, a birthday this morning. It's Evelyn Brown's birthday. And we are going to uh, sing happy birthday to Evelyn. So we hope you have a, a great day today, and congratulations. Well, now that your vocal cords are all warmed up, let's stand and sing our first hymn this morning. It's number 143, Who Put the Colors in the Rainbow? Well, good morning. How are you? Are you good? Is anybody there? Are you good? Yes. Do you want to speak a little louder? Are you good? Yes. yes. Excellent. You are here. Fantastic. Well, over the last few weeks, you've been thinking about how you can look after the planet. And I want you to use your memories for a moment now to think about the, the story of creation that we find in the Bible, or even maybe to remember some of the words of the hymn we've just sung. And I want you to tell me what it is that we are told that God has created. What has God created? Any thoughts? What has Whales. God... Whales! Yes! Yes! Is that right? Is that what you said? The world. Yes, God created the world. Fantastic. Anything else that God created? The what? The grass. Yes. Yes, God created the grass. Yes. The sea. Fantastic. Because we find in the, in the book of Genesis, in the story of creation, to God made heaven and earth, the world, and then God spent the next while making other things, didn't he? So he made the seas and the skies. And what lives in the, ski, the seas and the skies? What do we find in the sea that God has created? Fish. Fish. Yes, anything else? Sorry? Birds. birds. Yes, birds fly in the air, don't they? God created the birds. Fantastic. Anything else? Yes. People. 
That's right. So there was a, a sequence in creation of making the heaven and the earth, the sea and the sky, and then all the things that go in the sea and the sky. So we've got fish in the sea and whales that we just sang about and all the birds that fly in the sky and the animals that live on the ground. And then God created people. Has anybody got a pet? Yes. Right. What pets have you got? Dog? Dog? Rabbit? Guinea pig? Wow. Okay. Excellent. Fantastic. Now, how do you look after them? What do you do for them? Yes. You feed them. You give them food, don't you? Walk them. If you've got a dog, you, you walk the dog, don't you? Anything else? What do you what do you do? Yes. Play with them. That's right. You do, don't you? You play with them. Some of you may have seen my dog Soldier. Well, what do I do for Soldier? I give him some food, so he has lots of food to eat. I take him for walks, so he's got some good exercise. Give him water to drink and somewhere to to live, somewhere to to sleep at night. And also I take him to the vet if he's not very well. So I do all of these things to look after him. Well, we've been thinking about the fact that God wants us to look after the planet. So the same way in which we maybe look after ourselves, we look after each other, and look after our pets, God also wants us to look after the planet. And you've been thinking of many ways in which we can do that, and you're going to continue doing that now. Hello folks, you might find my voice is a bit deep this morning, so I've, I've been practicing singing baritone, but it's just a bit of a cold. One or two intimations, first of all, the first prayer group meeting of the season will be held this coming Tuesday, the 19th of October at 7.30. It'll last about an hour, there'll be a light supper served at the close of the meeting, and the theme of the meeting is hope. If anyone you know has passed away in the past two years and you'd like them to be remembered in prayer, please contact Sheila Love, who's here this morning. All other prayers will be displayed on a screen. There'll be a time of silence too if you wish to mention anyone who's in need of our prayers. And Sheila Love is here if you have any questions. Next Saturday, the 23rd of October, we have our first big event uh, for about 18 months. The Grand Central Band will be playing, uh, coming to entertain us, and that will be next Saturday, this Saturday coming from 7.30 till 10 o'clock. The, the halls will be set out in the cafe style, and ticket numbers are restricted to 90 in a first-come, first-served basis. You're asked to bring along with you refreshments and snacks of your own choosing. Tickets are available. Uh, they're going fast, and it's nearly the last opportunity. They're available from the events team, from Andrew Scott, from the coffee bar during the week, and be available in the coffee lounge after this morning's service. And it says you can pay either by card or by cash. So last chance, big event next uh, Saturday evening. Let's give it our support and get it off to a good start. Uh, just a quick announcement about the BB's Quiz Court. It meets on Saturday the 6th of November in the Golf Club. Uh, tickets are priced at £7 from Andrew Scott or any BB leader who can point you in the right direction. 
Now, the coffee bar will be available after uh, the service this morning, but it won't be in the usual place, the lesser hall, because the floor is being painted. So if you go into the lesser hall, you'll find you're stuck there for about a week because the paint's not dry. So it's in the new hall. So if you go out through that door and turn right instead of turning left, if you turn right and go out into the corridor and then back uh, into the new hall, the hall where the junior church meet. That's where the coffee bar will be this morning. And wouldn't it be good if this was all up on the screen and you wouldn't have to listen to me? So thanks very much, Philip. Thanks, Jack. Hope you get better soon. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. In the beginning, when the universe was no more than a twinkle in your eye, Creator God, there was a great explosion of potential, and something entirely new began to happen. In the beginning was the Word, your Word of permission and encouragement for that which was not you to start to be. And you looked on proudly as you saw what happened next. In the beginning was the life-giving breath of your spirit, enabling everything from the tiniest microbe to the largest dinosaur to have a life of its own, to struggle for survival and to adapt in ingenious ways to claim its place. And there, somewhere during that time, human beings, your finest achievement and the most dangerous threat to all that you had planned and hoped for, Sometimes, loving God, we forget that we are mortal and need to be put in our place, reminded just how small we are and how powerless. Sometimes we forget that we are made in your image, creative and inventive, with the ability to love new life into being. We need to be enabled to claim our strength and use our power well. Forgive us, gracious God, if we have tried to take your place or failed to take our own. Enable us to work with you, not against you, in the great project to which, in Christ, we have been called to renew the whole creation. And so may we share with you in the joy of seeing beauty restored, hope reignited, justice established, and lives redeemed through the power of your spirit and to the glory of your name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We sing now our next hymn. It's number 132, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
I wonder what God will say to us individually and collectively this morning as we read his word together. Our first reading is taken from Job chapter 38 and reading verses 1 to 7 and then verses 34 to 41. Let's listen to the word of God. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who gives the ibis wisdom or gives the cockerel understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens? When the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together. Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions? when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Our gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 10 and verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let us sit, one of us at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. We now present our offerings. Let's again come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, you summoned this day to dawn 
exactly as you have many billions of times before and will do so many billion times again. This day is special because we are here to share it. Loving God, accept our thanks and the offering of our lives and these offerings we have given this morning, every moment of every day that you give us. Amen. We sing again. We're going to sing now number 238, Lord, bring the day to pass. Number 238. We arrive at this part of the book of Job well and truly into the story. And what a dramatic story it is. I don't know if you've ever come across or read through the book of Job, but there's a series of discussions and arguments. And up to this point, there has been a double onslaught of disaster. Seven days and nights of compassionate silence from three of his friends, followed by three rounds of futile arguments. After several angry monologues and an intervention from a fourth person, Job finally gets what he has been wanting all along. And what has he been wanting? Some sort of answer from God. The narrator puts no apology or explanation into God's mouth. This is not Elijah's soft whisper of a voice, but a thundering reproach. God speaks out of the storm, out of the whirlwind, and into the depths of, God, of Job's questions and complaints. But God doesn't take Job's side, as we might have expected from the collapse of each of his friends' attempts at justifying or explaining the actions of God. The so-called Job's comforters who just made things worse. 
but in a dazzling display of visual imagery and an effusion of exquisite poetry, the great creator flaunts his achievement and puts Job very firmly in his place. Job finds the tables well and truly turned upon him. Just as he has been hurling questions at God and demanding a response, so now he is bombarded with unanswerable questions and asked with no small measure of irony, why? And Job is told, brace yourself like a man. You want some answers? Well, so do I. And so we are impressed on the one hand by how tiny and insignificant human beings are in the grand scheme of things, and amazed on the other hand that the great God, whose creativity and artistry is behind it all, should actually be bothered to care about us, or in Job's case, to grace him with an answer. The effect on Job ultimately, and which we can find out in subsequent chapters, if you'd like to read them for yourselves, is to silence, and more surprisingly, to satisfy him. The effect of the story on us is to draw us into a world that we did not know existed, and to enable us to view creation through the eyes of an ancient poet and a natural philosopher, one who has his own ideas about how the universe works, and who understands far more of its mysteries than we would ever have suspected. Was the writer of Job the David Attenborough of his day, perhaps? And where does this leave us with regard to some of the important theological questions that this story raises? And not indeed just raises, but tackled in this timeless and complex story. Questions like, why do bad things happen to good people if a benevolent and powerful God is in control? Are we deluding ourselves when we pray and imagine God is listening? Where is God? And what hope do we have of understanding God's ways? And these are questions that have been asked since the beginning of time. And the only answer seems to be that there are no answers. Certainly no single definitive answer but maybe a kaleidoscope of views based on human experience and our attempts to understand it. If the story of Job is to help us in our quest for truth, it is by encouraging honesty and tenacity on our part, giving us permission to say what we really think without fear or rejection from God, from a God who can sometimes be hard to pin down or to compartmentalize, but who is nonetheless there and who cares enough to engage with us in all the joys and sorrows of life. What the story of Job does do is to remind us of the creative love and power of God. God, we are told again and again, is the creator God has shown his immense love and creativity, but look at how we are treated. We are reminded in Genesis that we are to look after all that God has created and given to us. Many people have taken the phrase, to have dominion over the earth, a license to do, what it, to do with it what we will, to have no regard to the needs of others, let alone having regard to God's creation itself. But this is what we are tasked with doing. To look after creation. To work with it. To build and sustain workable, creative, loving relationships between all of God's creation. And how do we do it? The reading from Mark gives us an insight even though it is not immediately apparent. Because what we have is a request by two of the disciples to be at the right and left hand of Jesus at the time of glory. And that's a big request. But do they know what they're letting themselves in for? 
They seem to think that they can be baptized with the same baptism that Jesus has been baptized with and to drink of the same cup, meaning that they will be able to deal with any persecutions that come their way. And Jesus agrees with them that they will be able to deal with the things that come along. But as for their position when the time comes, well, that's not for him to decide. Of course, the other disciples were livid, but this is where Jesus gives his thoughts on leadership and management. Let's hear his words again. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Not the sort of thing that they were used to hearing, but this was Jesus' upside-down philosophy, at least upside-down in the eyes of the world. And so if we are to exercise leadership by serving others, whether that is here in the church or in our communities and neighborhoods, then surely that is to be extended to the way in which we, as humankind, exercise our leadership in the created world. Rather than mine the earth's resources until they are gone, and contaminate the air and the water tables and seas and rivers while we're at it, then surely we are to work with nature and use the resources carefully and efficiently and sustainably. Rather than overfish or destroy rainforests until they become desert areas, surely we can harvest just what is needed rather than what is demanded according to the profit desires of big corporations. Yes, we can decide to lord it over the planet, do what we want or can with it, but to lead through servanthood means that we can harvest the world with humility and gratitude and equality and justice. And it means that there can be enough for everyone. Why is it that won't, some countries won't take the threat of global warning seriously? Why don't some administrations want to limit carbon emissions? Is it greed or fear or something else? If we lead through compassion rather than greed, with justice rather than bias, through love rather than competition, then the task of caring for our planet becomes easier. It means that the water levels won't keep rising. It means that weather patterns will become stable. It means that we can view the rest of the world as brothers and sisters rather than enemies or people of whom we should be wary. Leadership of God's creation through servanthood, through compassion, for the whole of creation starts with us. So let's take the first steps and in faith hope that everyone else will follow. Amen. We sing that song now of uh, servanthood. Let's sing, sing together number 374 from Heaven You Came.
let's again come before God in prayer. Let's pray. God of miracles and wonders, we live in an age when it is harder than ever to be astonished. Never before in human history have we known so much, been able to do so much, and taken so much for granted. Electricity, space travel, supersonic flight, telephones, cars, the internet, these are all, are all old hat. We no longer have to rise from our chairs to see exotic creatures from distant lands. We can travel virtually through ocean depths and even go as tourists into space. Creator of all we know and of our capacity to go on learning, restore our sense of wonder if you can. Help us to grow down as Jesus said we should and become like little children so that we can praise you as you deserve and learn to trust you as we must if we are not to have too big or too small a sense of our own importance. And lest we forget just how privileged we are, we pray with sadness and shame for those in our modern world of wonders who would count it a miracle to have clean running water, a mosquito net, vaccination against disease, a worthwhile job to do, a safe home to live in, and food to give their children every day. God of the poor, champion of justice, we pause to think about what we have just thought and said and what it might mean for us if the good things of this earth were to be shared fairly among us all. Loving God, as we remember our world and our care of it and the people within it, we also pray for those who are unwell, wanting healing, for those who have lost loved ones, those in our own church community and those further afield, thinking this morning and praying for the family and friends of David Amos, murdered on Friday. We pray for this place of ours, this country and all the people that live within it, praying for your bless blessing upon them and your help for them. Loving God, we pray that you will give us compassion, not just a warm, fuzzy feeling, but a costly resolve to live and work for the day when your kingdom comes and your will is done here on earth, where de debts are cancelled, daily bread is given, and your name is honoured in our lives as well as our prayers. And loving God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sing our final hymn, just a reminder that uh, if you go for coffee into the new hall and you go through this door, turn right instead of left. Let's sing now our final hymn this morning. It's number 264, Judge Eternal, Throned in Splendor.
Loving God, send us out with courage. Send us out with hope. Send us out to share kindness. Send us out to do justice. Send us out to love. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and remain with you forevermore.